Hey everyone, today I'm gonna to talk about how to maximize your event photography coverage. I'm gonna approach this from three different directions. The first is going to be practical and logistical tips, followed by technical tips, and lastly, philosophical tips that will help you improve your coverage. Before we can really talk about improving coverage and my tips, we do need to talk about what your objective is as a photographer. This is going to depend on the type of job you're shooting, of course. In general, if you're shooting corporate events, political events, that sort of thing, your objective will be very different than shooting a private event like a birthday party, a bar mitzvah, a wedding, etc. The key to understanding what your objective is at each type of event is intended use. You need to consider how those photographs will be used. Uh, big corporate events, they usually need it for a variety of reasons. It could be for marketing, like social media. It could be purely for documentation. It could be for print, you name it. Uh, private events, often it's going to be to frame, to send to family members, etc. So understanding the intended use will help you shoot accordingly. Additionally, you want to balance the intended use with your own objectives as a photographer. For me, at every job I shoot, I'm always aiming to capture emotion-filled candids, interactions, that sort of thing. It's what I've really built my business on. And on top of that, I'm always working on something. If you want to improve as a photographer and, in, and stay engaged in your craft, you need to constantly be working on something. So you're going to want to carry that objective with you as well and find a nice balance between what your client needs and how you want to achieve that. Lastly, I also have a career goal and my career goal, and it's part of what I'm doing here on YouTube, is I want to elevate how people perceive event photography. I think it's really common to think of event photography as a roaming photographer that you know could be anyone behind that camera. They're just walking around, looking for groups, approaching them, taking a group photo. Uh, event photography can be so much more, and so my career mission is to kind of elevate that by pushing myself to create better and better work and to educate people in what event photography can potentially be for an artist. Okay, so before we can move on, I should define what exactly maximum coverage is, and I can do that by starting with what it is not. Maximum event photography coverage is not more photos. I'm gonna say it again, maximum event photography coverage is not about more photographs. The idea is to get more quality photographs. The idea is to shoot with intention and capture meaningful moments and get as many of those as possible. But we shouldn't be shooting for a set number. We shouldn't be like firing as many shots as we can. We should always have a purpose behind every shot. So the first thing we should focus on is VIPs and it will depend on the event, of course. If you're doing a big corporate event, if you're doing an award show, there's gonna be speakers on stage, an MC, that kind of thing. There's going to be celebrities, potentially. If you're shooting a private event, your VIPs will be family members. Of course, the birthday boy or birthday girl, the bar mitzvah boy, that kind of thing. But you want to find the right balance between getting as many shots of those people as possible and also trying to get coverage of everyone at the event. This can be a bit tricky and perception can be an issue. Uh, real quick, uh, I ran into a problem one time where really it was one of the best jobs I ever shot. I'm not even kidding. It may have been the best job I ever shot as far as like my hit rate, the quality of my work, etc. But the coordinator overpromised the client what I was going to deliver. They expected me to shoot video and photography simultaneously when I was very explicit that while I could get a few video shots here and there, that's not what I could focus on. I, I believe that you can do only one thing 100% and there, there will be a compromise if you do both. I was very clear with what I provided and when she realized that after yelling at me for not giving her a free video, um, she then said, well, you know what? You didn't take enough photos of me. And then I counted the photos up. There were more of her by far than anyone else. It's a perception thing. And so I would say try to overshoot the VIPs, if anything, and find the right balance of also getting a shot of everyone else in attendance. In addition to making sure you cover as many people as possible and give special focus, you also want to get a variety of different shot types. We don't do that just for the sake of it. We have different shot types that tell a visual story. I did a whole video on it. You should check that out if you haven't already, but wide shots, establishing shots to 
basically gives scale and a sense of space. You have your detail shots, you have your candid interactions, you have what I call close candids, uh, where you're zeroing in on one person's big reaction, that kind of thing. Regardless of any event, I'm always employing these shots. Um, this will go for anything. And pretty much any event, I am sort of covering the same way as far as my bread and butter. But again, like if I'm at an award show, I'm focusing on celebrities, VIPs, that kind of thing. Okay, let's talk about logistical and practical tips. The first one is you want to show up at a job ready to shoot. If I'm hired from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., I'm shooting from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. I'm not setting up my gear at 10 a.m. Um, that's just my personal policy. I like showing up ready to go. And so what that means is I check my cameras in advance, make sure they're working, I clean my lenses, I insert the memory cards I'm starting off with. Ideally, I shoot with cards large enough for the whole job and I reformat those cards. And lastly, and you may not have to do it, I make sure my file format is set to raw. I have to check once in a while because when, in normal times I'm teaching, I will often hand my camera to kids when I'm teaching the kids, and I will have them shoot in JPEG rather than raw because we have ancient iMacs that can't process the raw files in part. But anyway, I go through all of those so I'm ready to shoot when I arrive at the job. Next, I really recommend finding a convenient spot for your gear. You first and foremost want a safe spot, but next you want a spot that you can easily return to throughout the night. Uh, for me, I rarely shoot with two camera bodies unless I know I can't get to my gear often enough. But I've developed a sense for when things are gonna change up um, for a variety of different jobs, job types, like you can tell when the birthday cake is gonna come out without anyone telling you, that kind of thing. And I know to quickly get to my bag. Um, a little bonus tip, staying quick and light on your feet, wearing comfortable shoes, that kind of thing will also help uh, because you never want to run. I never do a full sprint. I do that like speed walking thing, you know, <laughs> that people do uh, competitively. I'll do that to my bag, quickly change my lens, get back out there and shoot. Okay, let's talk about breaks. Um, I don't take too many breaks personally, and I try to avoid them um, unless necessary, meaning like a bathroom break. But at the same time, it's okay to take a load off your feet. You need to find a way to have good longevity. You don't want to burn out. And if you burn out, you're going to miss shots. Remember, the goal is to get as many shots throughout the day or night as possible. And if you're burning out, you're not gonna do that. So take breaks if you need them. Um, I sneak them in, you know, I do like a minute or two at a time. I don't like long breaks. It depends on the type of job, of course. Next, we're gonna talk about diet. If you have a high carb, high sugar diet, you're gonna deal with blood sugar levels that can make it really difficult to work. It's gonna make it necessary to eat or you will be hangry. I know this from experience where I was definitely a carb addict earlier in my career and I was always hungry. And if you're always hungry, you're not really present, you're not really there for the job. So either go on a low carb, low sugar diet, some people won't want to do that, or get good at fasting, which is a lot easier when you don't have a high carb, high sugar diet, or bring snacks, bring some, put something in your pocket. Um, people know you're a person, it's okay to eat on the job. Um, I wouldn't do it in the middle of the dance floor. I would go, I go to a corner or I'd leave the room and I eat a little bit, that kind of thing. But you're a person, people know that it's okay to take a break and eat. The next tip is that anytime I enter a room, I will do a little head count and say, who have I photographed, who have I not photographed, and I try to get a shot of everyone there. Here's the thing, we want to shoot with intention, but we want to make sure we get a shot of everyone. But some people are not having fun or they do not show it. Some people are the life of the party. Naturally, we're going to gravitate toward that because we want meaningful shots, but what I'll do, I'll get a safe shot of a person if I know they haven't given me anything all night. Um, at the end of the night, I'll say, okay, I gotta get shots of this person. I will get at least one and then try to replace that shot and keep an eye on them periodically. Again, you don't wanna linger on one person because then you could be missing other shots. So we have to kind of balance it all out. Balance is obviously a theme of this video, I think. My last practical tip is avoid long conversations with Bob the Gearhead. There's always gonna be someone that wants to come up to you and talk camera gear. 
It's really important that we try to have a smile if possible. That's a problem for me because when I'm shooting, I'm very like zoned in and I might not be smiling. I don't have emotions um, when I'm shooting. Uh, but so we want to come off as affable, you know, approachable. We, we want to be friendly, but we don't want to get bogged down in not unnecessary conversation about cameras and whatnot. And there's always going to be that person that wants to do that. So you need to learn how to politely exit a conversation. Okay, when it comes to maximizing our coverage through technical means, I think I said it best in a past video where I took all my advanced tips and I talked about how they all come together. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut to that and you can skip ahead if you've seen it, but I'm gonna cut to that right now and then we'll talk about my last tips right after. So first, by pre-visualizing my composition, I already know the image I'm trying to capture. Because I've memorized my focal lengths, I know exactly what my field of view is depending on the lens I'm using. So what I'm able to do is walk the exact amount of feet forward, backward in order to get the shot I want. While I'm doing that, because I have pre-visualized my composition, I know where my subject matter is going to be in that composition, and I'm able to pre-select my focus point. By shooting with two eyes, I'm able to better time my peak of action, but on top of that, I'm also able to look for alternative shots. I'm basically waiting for a moment to happen, which I can predict by reading the body language, specifically the eyes, and I can time the pause in the sentences, the pause between sentences, and I'm able to make sure that if another moment is happening, I can switch over to get that moment. Event photography is about maximum coverage. Maximum coverage does not mean more photographs. Getting maximum coverage means you're capturing as many moments as you possibly can. Shooting with the two eyes assures that you're able to get alternative moments that are about to happen if the one you're waiting for doesn't happen first. Okay, let's talk about philosophical tips. Stay present. The biggest problem for staying present is typically your ego. And here's how I would like to explain that. Imagine you're perceiving things and then you're ideally instantly reacting to them. However, the ego kind of becomes a massive buffer where you're perceiving, you're buffering, and then you're reacting. I like jujitsu. <laughs> you guys are starting to learn this. I'm talking about it a bit more. Um, I like to use jujitsu as an example. Basically, when I'm training with lower belts or even some higher belts, you can see that delay, that buffer at play. What will happen is you will get a good position and maybe they get their position reversed and immediately the ego starts buffering. So they get reversed, the ego. Not again. This guy always beats me. I've been training for five years and I'm not getting better. Blah, 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 blah. React. They're missing the moment. They're behind so many steps. And ideally what you want is a quiet ego and you don't wanna be hard on yourself and have judgment and all of that. So you're perceiving and then immediately reacting. It's easier said than done. And before you can even calm your ego, you actually first need to make sure that shooting in general is now an intuitive experience for you. And that comes with practice. Uh, once you've shot in manual long enough, you're going to find you're dialing in your settings all automatically. You're not having to consciously think about any of those settings. You can just do it. If you guys are enjoying this content, please remember, I don't do affiliate links. I'm never selling to you guys. I'm really just trying to help you. I would like to make this channel more sustainable though. And if you want to support me, please check out my Patreon. I add extra videos up there. They're free to everyone. But if you want to support me, I would greatly appreciate it.